Okay, this is John Reed, live from Success Connect 2018. They say you save the best for last. I think it is true in this case, certainly for our listeners. I've got the brilliant minds behind Raven Intel with me. They're set to disrupt consulting as we know it, starting with HR. Welcome, Thank Michelle you. and Bonnie. Thank you very much. And you guys have had a big day because you had a big uh, announcement and competition. Tell us about that. Yeah, we did. Very exciting. Um, today, officially, Raven Intel opened. Um, we have been building our platform uh, full-time for the past six months, and um, very exciting. We Today was our, our big launch at the HR Technology Show. Uh, we had a chance to talk about our business at the Startup Pitch Fest, um, we had over about, I would say, like 200 people there. It was a really high interest, uh, you know, sort of event that that Pitch Fest was. And um, so it went really well. I mean, we had a lot of tough competition there. Um, and uh, it was really exciting to, to be part. Try not to be distracted by the pictures. <laughs> I know this part's hard to do that, but it's got to get, it's better when they're alive. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So it was really exciting to be a part of all that. I was just taking their pictures, which kind of screwed up the discussion. But. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? What what kind of feedback did you get? You know, I think HR customers, um, both at this show and every interaction that we have, love the concept of mm. a resource that they can go to for free and be able to make a better independent decision about a consulting partner. Mm. Um, I think. What we hear often is customers telling us, I wish that I had you guys, I wish I had Raven Intel um, you know, two years ago when we implemented our HCM. We mm. would have done a better job vetting our partner and the information that you have is, is what we would have needed to make a better decision. Mm. And um, so I think that the response from, from customers has been very positive. Mm. Okay. And so right now you're focusing on HCM, but of course you plan to, probably in the long run, this has relevance well beyond that. So you guys could certainly take this to other areas because I'm going to guess that in the, for example, the CRM space, there's the same set of issues and I know there are in ERP. So yeah, starting with HCM, which is good to have a focus. Yep. I mean, and and that's where where my background has been for the past 20 years. Uh, I've been in the HCM software industry and it was a need that I continued to see mm-hmm. um, for years, and uh, I, I wanted to, to solve it, quite honestly. And um, I think the nice thing is is that it's a platform that can easily scale into any enterprise cloud software uh, that uses a partner ecosystem for implementation, mm-hmm. and uh, we look forward to doing that in the future. Which is a lot of them. And I think the, the role of the partner is so often underestimated, right? Like... Like so often when we talk about these projects, we don't get around to that. And But when you read the stories on project failure, which still wind up in the news a lot, and mm-hmm. they, a lot of them, unfortunately, seem to be about HR, Yeah. Uh, the role of the partner is always in there somewhere. And I, I have this view that I think it's sort of getting more challenging now because the whole point of these kind of projects is this is way more than just payroll now. This is about, like, transforming your business. This is about you know, winning over talent. This is about managing diverse workforces, some of whom are not even your employees. Mm-hmm. And and I heard someone say the other day, like, software is changing and our whole, everything's changing, but the partners haven't changed, right? And and I think a lot of times partners are chosen based on silly reasons, like they won certain awards that, uh, frankly, you know, are handed out like candy, mm-hmm. or, they're, or they just have brand name recognition. And you know, to me, evaluating partners is is really important and hard to do. Yeah. And I guess that's why you guys are doing what you're doing. Yeah. And and I'll tell you what's uh, also antiquated and uh, uh, really inefficient is the way that customers do partner selection. I mean, that process is absolutely outdated, and mm. customers can't easily get through an evaluation. And really, you know, effectively invite a number of options uh, and evaluate a number of options to get a competitive look at what is available because the process is just so antiquated. And that's mm. another piece of what we do is streamline that process and, and 
really aggregate lots of sources of information in one single place to make it easy for a customer to quickly make that decision. Cool. So as of today, as of whenever someone's hearing this podcast, uh, uh, an HCM customer evaluating partners can reach out to you, and what will they get? Yeah. So they can go to ravenintel.com, okay. and they can they can easily search by software the various partners uh qualified to, to do implementations uh, or project work on that particular software. Um, they can evaluate, look at individual consulting firms and, and see the ratings that they've gotten from other uh, projects. So customers will come out and do reviews on, on a consulting firm on previous project work. And that's what's very important to customers is to be able to see those real-life examples uh, and that unfiltered voice of the customer. So all of that is, mm-hmm. is free to the customer. In addition um, to that, uh, the quote process is something that we absolutely handle and make more efficient for a customer. So a customer can come to us and say, hey, I have a project. I want to implement success factors or Workday or uh, any number of the cloud HCM systems. And we will streamline the quote process for them. Uh, they'll give us a little bit of information about that. We'll get the customer, or I'm sorry, get the consulting firms to them mm. so they don't have to explain themselves, you know, five times and a lot more efficiently get a project quote to start from. Cool. And by the way, just for our listeners, if it's not clear, like this was a big HR week, so this is no coincidence. This is happening now because we have, we're actually taping it at the Success Factor show, but there's a big workday show this week. And there's also the HR tech. Actually, I think Workday is coming up. Yeah, Workday it's Rising more, is in October, I yeah, think. Yeah, the, yep. the Workday one's coming up shortly. Yep. So this yep. is kind of like when all the HR tech comes to a head. Totally. And uh, and you guys are right in the, the thick of it. Um, what about this notion that 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 really with consulting partners, it's hard to say one is better than the other. It depends a lot on, like, the individuals involved, right? Like, and sometimes the individuals move from one firm to another. Like, how do we deal with that? Sure. Yeah, Michelle's def- stepping <laughs> up for this question. De- definitely consultants move from, from one firm to another. And um, in the review process, we have a way that uh, a, a very – a, a single consultant can be commended for their work on a project. On the other hand, um, we feel that even if consultants move from from firm to firm, the firm should be standing behind that project, uh, regardless if the consultant has moved on. Um, yeah, and we, we also find that teams uh, make the difference. Uh, one thing that really signals uh, the likelihood of customers being unhappy is if the team is switched from what Mm. they were expecting. We've heard the term bait and switch multiple times, and there was always, we know that that's going to end up being an unhappy customer. Sure. And you guys have actually compiled some some data, so you started to expose the aggregate view of what you're learning. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have here a state of HCM implementation Report, which is available on your website. Yes, it is. Uh, what kinds of things st- stood out to you from this? There's a lot to absorb here. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest overall findings is that the state of HCM implementation customer satisfaction is actually a little lower than it is for the airline industry overall. Ouch. So, yes. Ouch. <laughs> it's, about, it's about equivalent with cable companies. So. Oh, boy. But, <laughs> I mean, that said, there there are bright spots for sure. Um, you know, on our website, we certainly have firms that are doing great work for their for their customers, and it's clear from the ratings and from the feedback that their customers are willing to give that they're doing fantastic work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I suppose that's one of the interesting things that's going to come out in your work is which companies are excelling, and that that may be a hard pill for some of them to swallow, but hopefully that's tough love that they will put to work. We we hope that it highlights the good work that companies are doing and maybe helps companies also understand perhaps what the what their pitfalls are or what mm-hmm. The things that bother their customers and gives them an opportunity for um, for growth and improvement. Mm. And, you know, I think 
one of the things that we, you know, talk about with uh, the consulting firms is that, you know, one negative review does not define a body of work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what we really seek to do is get, um, you know, uh, enough reviews to really reflect the spirit of the overall customer satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, very, I think very visibly, though, issues or patterns will come up that a firm, you know, can isolate and address and then, you know, over time improve um, and, you know, very quickly, you know, even with new projects. Mm -hmm. So do you have a sense of why that is? Like when you said, like, the customer satisfaction is equivalent to the airline industry. What, what do you think is the cause of some of this frustration? I, I mean, I I think a huge aspect of customer satisfaction is about the team that is assigned to the project. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, where we see that being negative is when the team changes. Um, and mm-hmm. I think... That's actually on your list of the... The, the worst traits that a partner could have is what you call the bait and switch. Oh, if we hear, if we see, you know, bait and switch and mention, I mean, we, we can, we can guess that the, the NPS is going to be, you know, out of a, a 10, you know, yeah. probably less than five. I, I think the other huge uh, aspect to dissatisfaction is the scoping. So when a customer, mm. Um, you know, when there's, when there's change orders that happen during an implementation, I think that's equally as bad as a, a team member change, uh, or a the team dreaded change order. Yes. Yeah. The, the dreaded t- change order that is a result of the consulting firm not appropriately scoping the work up front or scoping it, under scoping it to get a good price. And mm. then, you know, at the, at the, at the last minute changing, sort of the, the price model based on new things that came up that they probably knew going in. Um, yeah. So change orders, I think, the, the more change orders that happen during an implementation, the less happy a client's going to be. Yeah, so we're going through, you have a, a view of common traits of partners rated eight or below. We just mentioned two of them. The other three are going over budget by more than 25%, which is pretty understandable. Inexperience in local geographies, and then customers who chose a partner based on price factor alone. So I think that's getting back to your point around how customers need to rethink some of their evaluate. It's not all on the partner, right? Like customers have to reevaluate how they're looking at these partners. Exactly. When, when, uh, when they choose on price alone, it's likely that that is also under scoped Mm. and, or, you know, that you're going to get an inexperienced team and those things, you Mm. know, are all related. Because it's pretty easy to underbid on a project if you're a services firm by withholding certain things or, or like you said, limiting a scope and then... And then, oh, surprise, yeah. there's, you know, six more months of work to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Over budget's a real problem, huh? Of course. I mean, that's, you know, when... When a, a firm signs a contract and and they think that it's a they think that it's a firm price and then it turns out that it isn't that's that's definitely a problem. Um, we find that if if somehow it happens that um, a project uh, goes past schedule but still is on um, uh, on budget that the the customers aren't necessarily that unhappy. We we have. Um, uh, Fifty-three percent of the projects in our database um, did come in on budget, um, but another thirty-seven percent—that means you know—ended up being anywhere from one and a quarter times expected budget up to twice the expected budget, and that definitely results mm-hmm. in in unhappiness. So, is this something uh, that you're going to be updating every year? Is that the plan, or? Absolutely. This this is um, based on the data that we have so far. Um, we anticipate getting many more reviews, especially with um, more people knowing about who we are and, and contributing reviews to the site. We'll be um, updating the research. Right. And, you know, our, our review process uh, that I just want to be clear about is, you know, we, the, the I think, why customers will come to Raven is the fact that we authentically um, provide the, the, the voice of the customer, the unfiltered voice of the customer. The process mm-hmm. that we have for these reviews um, is, is, is significant because we 
we uh, verify the authenticity of every single review that we have. We know mm-hmm. who provided it. We know the company as well as we verify that that um, you know that that person worked on a project and that company you know um, actually had that software. And that that's mm-hmm. significant. We would never publish reviews that were were non vetted. Um, we do anonymize uh, the customer information on the site, so uh, the name of the customer uh, or any contact details is mm. absolutely held in confidence, um, and that, I think, helps with the candor of the client uh, being able to, to speak um, freely about the experience. And this initial survey was based on over 100 reviews. Now, what what that strikes me is it seems to me that where where it will benefit you as you get more and more volume is it'll be easier to detect patterns with particular vendors because I think with like with with a hundred or so I think you can get really good patterns and implementation trends like you did and partner trends. It seems like to drill into vendor quality, for example, that a bigger sample size will help a lot to really validate. This is just my I'm riffing mm-hmm. on this at the moment. I don't know what you think, but mm-hmm. it seems well, to me that will really help you. I think that we have um, what we feel is, you know, initially a, a statistically significant, you know, sample to reflect, um, you know, uh, really a, a good amount of experiences. Where we think that the, the data will head in the, the future will provide a dynamic look and a changing look at how, um, you know, things change over time, partners change, implementations right. Change products change that will impact the success of projects, and so absolutely, this information that we have is dynamic. And what we really seek to be is, um, you know, the, the the knowledge base essentially on what makes a good project, uh, mm-hmm. and we feel confident that our data set is going to reflect that dynamically over time. And every site like this has to come up with. Uh with a business model to figure out how you're going to, you know, yeah, you want to have integrity to, to your um, data and your surveys, but how are you going to fund this? So mm-hmm. what did you come up with? Right. So the site is free to HR customers. Yeah. It is free for SIs or consulting firms to be listed on the site as well. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the the enhanced model, though, that that, that is monetized, Firms can uh, have advertising throughout the site um, mm-hmm. that uh, that they that they can pay for. Um, I do want to be clear: there's we do not have any model that would ever allow for a firm to change reviews or allow us to present the information in any other mm-hmm. way than was you know is is exactly reflective of the reviews that we get for that that firm. Um, also, you know the data set that we have. Um, I think is, is going to be interesting to software firms as they can benchmark themselves and get deeper mm. analytics about how they compare to the rest of the industry. Mm. And did you also, I assume you kind of took a look at sites like G2 and Trust Radius and such, and kind because of, this the weakness of those sites historically has been not looking at the services partner angle, right? Just looking at the software. Um, I know that some of those sites are starting to tiptoe into this space. Have you kind of looked at that and how you could differentiate from that? Mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, while we're akin to a Glassdoor, Trust Radius, or any number of those software peer uh, review sites, I think where we differ significantly is our deep focus, number one, with HCM uh, and enterprise cloud implementation. Mm-hmm. Um, but number two, I think with the high specificity about project work. It's not just a, oh, you know, from any user's perspective, how do they, you know, how would they rate, um, you know, a firm? But it, we're really looking at more than just, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. We're looking at those levers like on-time delivery, on-budget mm-hmm. delivery, quality of, you know, the and responsiveness of the partner as it relates to the product um, and things like that. And I think, you know, where where we're really going to have um, you know a, a unique value proposition for customers is that deep level experience uh, with specific you know projects project work as it relates to HCM and um, you know and, and definitely G two Crowd and, and those others uh, don't have that. Absolutely. Well, uh, you got to be able to, to tell people how you're 
you're different. And I, I've been frustrated a little bit with review sites because I feel like that there's been such an emphasis on volume, you know, and acquiring the volume of reviews because everyone wants the the data from thousands of data points. But I, you know, I go to some shows where they have almost like welcome wagon type things of like, oh, you know, write us a review, a great review in like three minutes and throw that up there or whatever. And I'm like, how does this help the customer to have like just a bunch of positive, happy reviews jammed up? You know, because I'm, you know, I think about the enterprise, I think about, well, I have a particular industry situation I'm dealing with. I have a particular set of problems. I want to really, I want some benchmarks that really help me understand my situation, not just like, oh, you know, this software is great and a thousand other people gave it the thumbs up. I don't think that's really going to fly, at least not in a large enterprise. Well, well, that's right. I mean, we we don't want to be just thumbs up or thumbs down. We want uh, customers to be able to go in and search and say, hey, you know, here's here are other projects that happened in my industry with a, a similar kind of module, similar, similar kind of geography. And of those projects that are most similar to mine, which one of those firms you know, did a good job? And in which ways mm. did they do a good job? It's not just thumbs up or thumbs down. It's, you know, hey, they were they were on budget. They had a great process. Um, and, and we also uh, ask about lessons learned and what the specific strengths of the consulting firm were. So we really want to get beyond thumbs up and thumbs down and get to a point of thinking about fit. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean... What I can tell you so far is I, I'm glad to see another independent voice in this market. And you guys have been a lot of fun on Twitter, too. If you guys don't follow Raven on, on Twitter, <laughs> you guys jumping in, a bit outspoken sometimes, which is fun. And, um, you know, I think to me, like, the, the big thing is that I'm, I, I often advocate that customers need more independent voices, which I think is true. But I also think it's fair to say that the very few people in the enterprise are truly independent and and what I'm looking for is the disclosure of the business model. I want to understand, like, for example, Diginomica, I think we have a strong voice, but we're also funded by a number of vendors, and so we try to be very clear about where our money comes from and and let let the audience decide, you know, where the pros and cons of that are. And we can't possibly, from our perspective, sum up the, the marketplace and the issues customers need to be concerned about. We can only be one piece of that. We need a lot of other firms and voices out there. And I think the same is true for you guys. Like you're going to have ways of funding this business model. You're just going to need to be transparent about what that is. What drives me crazy about a lot of the ranking systems, a lot of the analyst firms do is I don't see that transparency. And you know, transparency is a, is a big word word and what we're solving for within, you know, implementation. And I think, you know, as we run our business, we also, want to seek that transparency. I think that that in the, in the, at the end of the day benefits the customer. And Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, we are, as you mentioned, independent, um, you know, as we, we grow this business though, uh, we also want to be very, uh, transparent with, with customers as to what that revenue model is and, and how that might change over time. Right. Because you, you, I could see your revenue model evolving quite a bit as you figure out like, what the angles are that are the best ways to fund your business. And so, you know, yeah, you'll need to continue to be upfront, I think, about what that is. Mm-hmm. But but that's a good challenge to have. Yep. I mean, I, I, I hope you guys have a lot of success. What do you think what do you think the big challenges are going to be for you? Um well I mean we we've talked about volume of, of mm-hmm. uh of reviews, and while we don't want just you know a million platitudes, um, right. you know we we want we want enough reviews out there that the site is very very useful for a lot of different customers. Um, mm-hmm. So that is really you know one of our major pushes right now, mm-hmm. um, and and getting the data which really allows uh, customers to to find the right fit. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah, and I, I would say. I, I, you know, just visibility within the space. We want customers to know that Raven exists and that mm-hmm. that we exist to help them, and we can mm. do so um, at no cost to them. Mm. And so I think just making sure that 
Um, customers know that they can come and, and have a resource with us, an independent resource um, that will help, at the end of the day, ensure the success of a, of a project. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least give them enough confidence that they've, you know, that they've looked at all of the options that mm-hmm. are available to them and not, you know, just, you know, inviting in the one vendor that, that perhaps the, the software company recommended. Yeah, and it makes me wonder if there, if that wouldn't eventually become part of your business model for more extended consulting with customers who might want a more independent advisor. I'm just throwing that out there. You probably thought through this already and mm-hmm. come up with ideas about that, but it makes me wonder because personally, I'd, my goal for you would be to see as much of your funding come outside of vendors as you can possibly do, mm-hmm. you know, but yeah, I guess you'll figure it out over time. Yeah. So if I were to make a list of your challenges, I think the other one I would add is Obviously, some partners and vendors are going to come out looking really nice in your data, and some some are not. Mm-hmm. And I think the ones that are not are going to be interesting challenges for you as far as how you're going to relate to those individuals. You're certainly going to see them at shows. Um, you know, you may hear from their lawyers at some point. Um, though that's going to be interesting for you guys, and I, I I'm sure you have a plan for it. And mm-hmm. you know, and frankly, the the ones that I respect are going to reach out to you and say, can we learn more about how we can get better? Because Mm -hmm. that's the idea. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that they'll treat it as motivation and not antagonism. Yeah. And I I think the spirit of our business is, is not to make vendors or or firms look bad. That, that is not what we sought out to do. What we want to do is elevate and raise the visibility of the, the firms that are doing great work for clients and and have those have more opportunities with customers because of the merit and quality of their work. Mm. All right, well let's spin it forward a few years like uh if if things go really well, give me the <laughs> really dreamy view of where you guys would like to be yeah. in a few years. Well, I I would say that, you know, what we'd love is for t- to be the independent voice within HCM about mm-hmm. all things implementation. I think that that would be, cool. um, that, that is really where our goal is. And I think once we feel that we have, have done that effectively, I think, and created a model, I think then we can very confidently look at other markets, you know, like Salesforce.com or Cloud ERP in mm-hmm. the future. But, you know, we're not moving there just yet. We, we, we want to make sure that this, we have this model working and then move to those and right. scale to those others. Cool. Is there anything else you want? Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. Great. Yep. We want to, we want to be laser focused and go deep, um, before we go broad. Makes sense. Anything else you guys want to talk about? It's been a fun conversation for me, but it's late in the day. We're all a little tired, but <laughs> anything else? Podcasts are supposed to be a little informal, so. Anything yeah. else you want to get into that we didn't cover? Uh, gosh, I think we've covered a lot. Yes, a lot we of ground. Sh- we sure have. We sure have. Um, what was it, what was your favorite thing in Vegas? My favorite thing. Uh, hmm. Well, I'm only uh, like a little bit into my my travels here this time. I arrived at 3 a.m. last night. But um, my mm. favorite thing in the Aria Hotel was the juice bar. Mm. Mm-hmm. I got I got some. Fresh green pressed vegetable juice. That oh, was nice. probably the highlight of my <laughs> my my hungover morning from my flight. Perfect. Um, but uh, other than that, well, and the other highlight for me is the customer interviews. I, yeah. I, I did three customer interviews today, and um, to me, that's always the highlight is just hearing what really goes on in projects and how mm-hmm. people overcome their issues. I mean, that's what really fascinates me because my my big thing is that I think the um, the technology has gotten to the point where it's good enough. It's not perfect, but it's good enough that it really brings a spotlight on the people and the culture of organizations because it's really getting harder and harder to blame the tech when things go wrong, but but it all has to work together. And so when you hear these customers share what they're doing about that, you know, I was talking with American Airlines today about like how they handle 
like customer experience and employee experience, and I'm challenging them on like my times on the tarmac and stuff. And <laughs> those are those are great conversations. Getting you reminded mm-hmm. me of it because of your airline satisfaction yeah. thing, mm-hmm. and and just to hear what they're trying to do about that, and you know, is like super interesting because mm-hmm. they can't just throw technology at that problem. Mm-hmm. You know, because when I'm stuck on a tarmac with some flight attendants, they can't throw success factors or work day at me or whatever it is, it's <laughs> right. still ultimately is still a human being that I'm dealing with. Yeah. And that's to me what it's all about is figure out how it all, how it all works together. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, the implementation partner of course is a really fascinating part of that. And this is a conversation for another time, but I think um, I'm fascinated by this notion of how partners need to transform to keep step with all of that. Yeah. And I think your data points to some of the problems there, and that's a really good conversation to have. So mm-hmm. maybe we can have that in the future as you compile more information. Yeah, we'd, we'd love, love that. So, yeah, that'd be awesome. All right, well, officially, good luck and congrats on the launch, and hopefully make waves. And women disrupting tech is always great, right? Absolutely. So evil plans for the win? <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's go do something fun. Thanks for joining me. Thanks. All right.